I thought um, today I would do a dive into my music for psychedelic therapy project and just give like a wee tour around the session um, which has about seven and a half hours worth of music in it and you can see I've started editing uh, quite a few of them um, all over the show and at the beginning here I've started stitching together multiple compositions and uh, they're all color coded by key at the moment um, and yeah when I stitch them all together into one musical tapestry I'll probably switch to a more like instrument based color coding system but for now this seems to be doing the trick uh, so yeah uh, within this one session we've got three different days of recording um, up here on the top we've got the first session the second session here and uh, the final third session down here and uh, yeah before we get into it I thought I'd show how each of those sessions differed because uh, we kind of built upon our process each time uh, so our first session was real simple um, and everyone was fully separated we had drums in their iso booth here synth and piano here and a, a guitar here with the amp in this room here and um, yeah this gave us full separation and these pedals ran through the synth so someone could be playing with effects while the synth player was playing and it was like back and forth uh, there which is really cool and uh, yeah we created a musical tarot system based off of research from John Hopkins that uh, compiles all the traits of music which are the most conducive to psychedelic therapy and particularly mystical experiences. So we created this deck uh, to gu guide in improvisations and um, yeah they are correlated with different mystical arts from uh, various artists and um, yeah they're all real beautiful and to respect the artists uh, we didn't use them at all outside of the recording process and most of the uh, on the websites of the artists they seem to be fine with using them in the educational context um, cool yeah there's some pics from the first session yeah we're session two much more elaborate um, really took full separation to the max possible using every single room in the studio and we had various baffles between uh, all these instruments in here um, and I'll show you some of that soon and how that sounds and yeah the big difference with this one is we added a little bit of like ritual ceremony to the opening of the of the session um, and uh, knife edge Sabrina projected visuals correlating to the cards onto the the walls so the performers had some guidance and this would like essentially activate their tarot cards um yeah whereas oh here are some like uh, stereo vocal setups and examples here and some examples of the gear we ran things through to really exaggerate harmonics as much as possible uh, especially this drum mic which is a good time and yeah, we also had uh, another form of stimuli for the vocalists. They read session reports from mystical experiences. And yeah, final session did kind of the opposite because we wanted to maximize the feeling of ceremony and ritual. We had everyone in the same room utilized uh, decatry and other orchestral recording setups, live track through a plate, had everyone together, used a bit of baffling to mitigate bleed. Uh, but we really tried to use bleed to our advantage that time instead. And uh, the only people separated were the vocalists who had a stereo set up in a bloom line in two booths. And uh, yeah, the idea behind that was that ritual is, you know, conducive to improvisation through my research. So uh, yeah, we maximized that through the engineering as well to get as much like uh, communitas and yeah maximum vibes so yeah uh, yeah three very different approaches to recording and um, yeah I think I could play a bit from the first session this pink one 
which of course is E minor. Um, <laughs> uh, and yeah, you can hear some of the sound quality that we got from this one. <laughs> Skip to the section that it looks like it's got a spicy groove going on. So you can see uh, we can fully isolate the drums because um, in this initial session they had their own room. And yeah, this drum setup was, uh, you know, trying to emulate one of the references from the John Hopkins material being used for psychedelic therapy, uh, which was echoes in this main section. So kind of copied the uh, classic rock Pink Floyd style drum setup um, using Glenn Johns and a variation on Glenn Johns, which also had a anti Glenn Johns uh, parallel to it. So. Yeah, you can hear that. So this is the U67s. Bright and crispy. And then you've got the anti Glen Johns, which are... Provide like a perfectly in phase room sound. And uh, yeah, this was the only session we mic'd up the toms for as well, because of course Echoes has that beautiful like present tom sound and we really wanted to grab that in at least one of the sessions yeah um yeah i don't want to talk about drums too much but uh because i will uh but yeah uh kind of chasing harmonics we really squashed the crap out of a couple of mics in the room um one being this fleet 47. So yeah, that was running through a Neve preamp into a germanium compressor. Um, actually, I think it was running through the SSL preamp and we are driving uh, the preamp gain on there and adding some harmonics. And yeah, everything in the session is fully isolated. So we piano setup as well. Uh, one that I picked up from Thomas Voice, who did uh, Jake and Jasmine's recent album. Um, it's really my go-to piano technique at the moment. This one here, uh, XY pair of KM184s and some Neumann 87s. And yeah, running those through various preamps and compressors um, to get really the condensers get that bright, uh, airy, emotive sound over the hammers, and uh, the 87s get the body. Um, yeah, we did have a unique one under the piano in this session as well, which was just kind of warbling away through uh, effects. Yeah, that's the only session we did that for. Um, cool, yeah, so that was an example of session one full separation. Uh, session two, um, just a reminder, session two looks like this. So yeah, drums and percussion in this room here, everything with keys in this room, projections on these guys, and then we got stereo and mono vocals happening. Um, yeah, this one is spacey as heck.
look at another example from that session. Um, this is one I've not quite finished editing. I haven't got to the vocals yet, but it could be cool to listen to the percussion because this one had uh, both hung drum and drums in uh, that same room. So there's bleed there, but it worked out quite beautifully. So if I grab the full kit and the percussion, which in this case is Kevin on the hung, um, yeah, you'll be able to hear the blend between those. Something really interesting about this is uh, we had a uh, vibraphone mic'd up and um, no one was playing vibraphone, but um, it has this gorgeous room sound. You can hear it's getting beautiful ruby piano, it's getting some of the tinklies of the roads as well. Just heaps of room ambience and uh what i've got set up on this channel over here is a crystallizer a bit of eq huge room reverb in the tape machine to give it some wobble and then you can actually because there's no vibes on it i was like oh i can use this for some like messed up effect and here we go And yeah, this uh, blended in with the with the tune is quite fun. Um, let's see if we'll grab the matriarch and we'll grab the full kit as well. So yeah, just having that there for something creative to play with later and do certain throws and mixes between the two. Cool. Yeah, very exciting performances in the second session. Um, and yeah, on to the third. Uh, an example from there is, yeah, so for the third session, like I said, we really relied on orchestral recording techniques. So. Had a beautiful Decca tree set up here. Um, two wide uh, Neumann 87s which ran live through the plate. And yeah, kind of intentionally placed everyone in the room for where I would want to pan them in the mix. So then your panning, uh, when it comes to logic, is coherent with the image that your room mics actually create. So. When you pull up your close mic, they're reinforcing the bleed that is in the room mics. Um, so you're not fighting against that. And we also got really lucky that the performances are actually just really coherent as well. So um, there's very little stuff that I'm like, damn, I wish that wasn't in there, um, which is really good and a testament to the amazing players that we had um, throughout. And yeah. Uh, yeah, and one of the most exciting things about this was we had Tom and Porto. Um, yeah, I'll see if I can play a bit of this for you. Just jump in randomly. Who knows where we're going to land?
so yeah, collection of gorgeous noises there. Skip ahead to one with percussion in it, so we can hear what the decatrice sounded like. Um. Cool, so this is the deca, and that comprises of a center mic, which I believe is a C12, um, and yeah, two four one fours on the sides. Um, then you can hear we've got beautiful picture of the drums and the cymbals, heaps of organ, heaps of the extra percussion as well. You can hear it kind of creates an image and you can place everything in the room as well. Whereas these are the close front lines. And of course the beauty of this is, you know, when you edit in a piece of Tonga Porto when it's playing, brings up a beautiful room ambience with it. So it's almost like it feels like some instruments pull up the rest of the band with them and this intensity rises with them. So a beautiful thing to consider when editing is like, how am I actually affecting this distant off axis sound of everyone else? And like, can you use that to your advantage as well? Um, but yeah, editing can be like a real sweet creative process. Uh, upright bass as well, heaps of fun. Let's chuck some uh, compression on that. section because the tongue porto and the upright bass they were next door neighbors in the in the layout and they really went into this beautiful and strange rhythmic kind of interplay here stuff going on and yeah beautiful vocals in this whole, whole team and yeah uh, organ was a pretty typical organ setup you know like two on the side of the Leslie and then one down the bottom getting the uh, getting the low end And, uh, oh yeah, the plate. Gorgeous plate. That was just uh, everything in the, in the big room through these 87s that went through the plate. Uh, cool, the neat stuff in here is the extra percussion. So on the left and right, Actually, it ended up being of the drum kit. To the left, um, we had... So this is on the hi-hat side of the drum kit. So it's tabla. And then to the right, we had cajon. And Kevin also had a few shakers and things. Be something different. Shishi, shaky thing. Cool. And yeah, combining those two together. 
locked in the camp. Add the dicker in. Play it. Down to get some of those. Cool, so just a note as well on you may be wondering how the hell are you going to decide how to stitch this all together? Um, I am probably planning on releasing these all as individual tunes with individual artworks as well, but um, I'm pretty keen to make a compilation which is most ideal for psilocybin therapy. And uh, yeah, the reasoning behind this is um, digging into some research which I could use as a scaffold for this like macro structure. Um, so yeah, uh, this represents the intensity of a psilocybin experience over time um, with some placebos and uh, you know other measures and. Yeah, so you get a really good scaffold or map of how intense someone will be experiencing the medicine at um, different points in time. And yeah, I essentially have combined that research with research uh, from questionnaires uh, on what music is most supportive or most useful at different uh, periods. Uh, and that is from the participants and themselves. Um, so essentially combining that timeline of intensity with the questionnaire data, um, you know, we can create a scaffold for that uh, longer macro kind of form. And yeah, uh, kind of in summary, uh, found that more ambient, major and supportive music is fantastic for leading into it and returning, whereas in these peak periods here, it was much better to have more intense and cinematic music going on. So what I had done was had my supervisor, Neil, uh, analyze all the recordings that we did and rate them from ambient and supportive to intense and cinematic. So through this data, I can kind of map which point um, in the timeline of the psilocybin experience all these different tunes would be best suited for. So got decent chunk for intense cinematic, which would be obviously most useful between 120 and 180 minutes, and then plenty of ambient and supportive stuff for the before and after. Um, and yeah, of course, um, also taking con to, into consideration like uh, key changes in between and kind of like cross fading different performances, um, which I've already done a bit of. Um, and yeah, uh, another interesting thing, which you just heard from this tune here with the percussion is we implemented an idea I came up with called ryth rhythmic consonants and um this really stemmed from the fact that um music for psych psychedelic therapy tends to favor simple ratios so simple intervals and simple temporal time ratios as well and this example can be seen because one of the recommended traits is simple triadic harmony drone, um, you know, usually like major or minor simple modes. And of course, drone is both the simplest ratio or interval, and it's the simplest across time as well, because rhythmically it's, um, yeah, it's just droning. Um, so yeah, what I thought is that you could take this, this idea of consonants and simple ratios, and then you apply it to the temporal dimension, the time dimension. Um, which has precedent for being very important because, um, uh, you know, often in these psychedelic states, people experience beyond 3D kind of experiences, whether that's through the music or dilation of time or geometry, um, acting how it normally wouldn't. So yes, by essentially correlating the tempo with the key center uh, using this equation here, we can make it so essentially the rhythm is an octave of uh, of the key center. So conformally, it holds the same relationships. Um, and yeah, the interesting thing about this neurologically is 
in your auditory cortex, you perceive music uh, in the auditory cortex and you show synchronous uh, neural firing. So if you were in an MRI machine and someone played you an A, you would be able to look in someone's auditory cortex and that exact neural frequency would fire at the exact same rate. Um, and this interestingly doesn't happen with color, which, um, which is strange. And um, yeah, also with rhythm, different parts of the brain synchronize to that. The EEG patterns in, I believe it's the supplementary motor area, the bilateral putamen and the uh, chordate, I think I'm saying that right, they all synchronize. Um, so the EEG patterns in these parts of the brain, these older, more primitive parts of the brain, synchronize to rhythm, beat, and meter. Um, and what all these parts of the brain have in common is that they have to do with learning and movement. Um, and this explains a lot. This explains why when you hear a beat, you know, it's not your auditory cortex so much synchronizing. It's the parts of your body to do with movement and motor planning. So that's why we dance. That's why we move to the beat. We don't move to the melody so much. Um, and yeah, but the interesting thing about applying this idea of rhythmic consonants, where your key center and your BPM are correlated by octaves or um, some other ratio that you decide, is in fact, you end up synchronizing the auditory cortex and these older, more primitive parts of the brain by a degree of octaves as well. So you're creating this like neurological consonants between EEG patterns in the motor areas and the synchronous neural firing in the auditory cortex. So this actually has a like a neurological significance that is really cool. You can essentially harmonize different areas of the brain through this technique. And yeah, because of the prevalence of simple uh, ratios in uh, peak music or mystical experience music that's been found, um, yeah, maybe this is beneficial. And maybe my thought is that this will lead to like a more coherent and cohesive experience. Um, and this may in turn have effects on the geometry people are uh, envisioning during the mystical experience as well, um, because there are so many novel communications between different parts of the brain and the visionary cortex as well so yeah just thought that was something cool i'd like to share cool yeah so i hope this gives everyone a good idea of what i've been up to um what i've been up to now is literally just going through all of these doing heinous amounts of editing um and yeah, eventually this will go on to be mixed, submitted, mastered, and um, yeah, will go on to guide people's journeys um, through mystical experiences and psychedelic therapy and hopefully lead to some more positive outcomes in patients because it's rich in all these traits of music um, that were recommended by John Hope. John Hopkins. So yeah, um, thanks for tuning in.